uh, and it's called Active Study Strategies. And it really is, a, you know, it's important to build good academic habits now. You know, some of you might, excuse me, can you check in, please? Uh, some of you might think, nah, I got this, I don't need new habits, I already know how to study, I know my system. But a lot of times what works in high school might not work in college, or you may, might have picked up some habits that aren't you know, the best, and so this is the time to, uh, to really start focusing on that. Um, without further ado, Jennifer, take it on. Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Jennifer Luarca. I'm an academic coach at the Learning Center, and I'll go through some of our resources available to you at the end of this workshop. But as Sonia said, I'm here to talk about active learning strategies. Uh, the purpose of this workshop is to engage you. So what I'm going to be doing is putting up a series of statements or questions, and I'm gonna ask for you to say if you do these things or not, and to chime in. So please be ready to participate. Uh, the workshop goes a lot faster and smoother if um, I get your interaction, okay? And the content's really planned for like 35 to 40 minutes, so I know some people have four o'clock classes. We should be good to get you there on time. Um, so yeah, first of all, I'd like to start by asking, what week are we in? Fourth week. We're in the fourth week, so by Friday, we're a quarter of the way done with the semester. 25% is over. So I want you to think back at the past four weeks. How fast did that go? Like super fast, right? I've been telling students this all week so far, and they're like, it's the same response, a collective gasp, like, oh. Right, so those first four weeks go fast, but I'm gonna tell you right now, the last four weeks go even faster. So it's really this middle stretch where we start to kind of fall into our patterns, figure out our systems, and it, it stretches a little longer. Now is the time to start to adjust your study behaviors. So think about these past four weeks, as soon as you start getting feedback on assessments, grades on your tests, I want you to think, am I doing the things I need to do to educate myself, right? There's a ton of resources here. Sometimes it's overwhelming how much support is on campus that students don't know where to go or what to do, so they just don't. Um, now is the time to start to think, you know, how am I doing, how are my grades looking? And if they're not looking how I want them to look, what's a commitment I'm gonna make to myself these next four weeks to start to change a behavior, okay? So if you set yourself up with a four week, every four weeks, check in. Have a moment with yourself to evaluate what you've been doing and what needs to change. And then the last thing is, what resources am I gonna use to get there, okay? Coaching can be one of those resources. Uh, we have learning support. I know your college has learning support. What's another resource you could reach out to? Your professors in office hours. How many people have been to office hours yet? Oh, that's a good turnout. Maybe like six or seven people. That's pretty good. I strongly encourage you to make it to office hours, especially in the context of a post-exam review. Take a look, even if you did well. Take a look at the exam with your faculty member in a non-stress situation, right, after the test is done and look at how you did. And I want you to look at it not just from the perspective of did I study correctly, but also how can I reshape taking notes? What study tools can I start to use to do better, right? Um, so that's a really important piece too, and me and my colleague Lori Joy, are the two staff members that are coaches, we can go with you to office hours to take a look at an exam with you and the professor and talk just about revising your study strategies. So if you don't do well, or if you're doing well and you wanna become more efficient and you want some support in that situation, you can always reach out to us, okay? And I'll have contact information there at the bottom. All right, here we go. First question, statement. Sitting in week four. Show of hands, I do my reading assignments before attending lecture. 
How many people are totally caught up in reading? Be proud. Put your arm way up. Okay. So it looks like a little over half. Good job, first of all. That's hard to do. And I guarantee that if I were to come back at week eight, halfway through the semester, and ask the same group, less than half will raise their hand. Right? It's hard to stay caught up with reading. But why is reading assigned? What's the goal there? Why are your professors wanting you to read before you come to class? So that you can gain a better understanding of the concepts and what you're learning in that class? Yeah, so you can gain a better understanding of the concepts and what you're about to learn about in class. Any other reasons why reading might be assigned that you can think of? You can ask questions. So you can ask questions and engage in lecture, right? So really the goal of the reading is to start to lay that foundation. So now you go to class, it's not the first time you've heard the information, right? It's the second or third time you've thought about it. And now you can start to participate in discussion. You can ask questions, right? Whether that's actually talking in class or just writing questions you have down. You don't need to be an extrovert to be an active, engaged student in lecture, right? But having a foundation of understanding really supports your ability to learn from the experience of the lecture. So what we want to encourage you to do, for those of you who aren't reading and for those of you who will soon find it's hard to stay caught up, is we want you to get just a quick preview of material before you go into class. It will significantly increase retention from lecture if you're able to do a quick preview. So maybe just go through and check out the bolded terms. See what you know and what you don't know, right? Um, how else could you do a preview of material? Any other ideas? Maybe you don't have the book. You can watch videos. You can watch videos, right? I guarantee you there's socials dedicated to the subject you're learning about. Check out the social pages, right? Uh, how do we learn things in daily life? We watch videos, typically, shorts, and we tune into our social media. You can do the same in order to get preview of concepts for class, okay? Google it. Right? Watch a quick five minute video. If you're not sure what's going to be covered, how can you tell? If you don't have the book and you don't know what, what's going to be covered in lecture, where do you look to figure out what to Google? Any ideas? You could ask people in the class, hey, can you screenshot the table of contents and send it over to me? Then I can start to Google those terms, right? Or I can look up videos on those terms. I strongly believe the table of contents is the most powerful resource in that textbook because it gives you a hierarchy of thought and allows you to see what connections the author and most likely your professor think are important. So that's a really important piece and you can easily get a snapshot of that from a picture. How else could you tell what's going to be covered in class if you don't have the book? You could check your canvas, the syllabus. Yes, canvas, syllabus, <coughs> right? All of those places should have, maybe you don't have the full PowerPoint available, but you can at least look at if they list out terms, something, right? And then start Googling. We basically want you to go into class kind of warmed up to receive information. And if you think about it, um, anybody go to the gym or exercise or play an instrument or anything like that? What do we do before we get started? We warm up, we stretch, right? I'm a runner, I don't always stretch before I run. So you don't have to do that, but you get a lot more out of it if you do. Same thing with learning. If you warm yourself up, you're gonna get a lot more out of that lecture, okay? Next question, show of hands or next statement. Who believes they can multitask well? Anybody? Kinda. So 
it's interesting because I've been doing this question for a really long time. I've worked on campus for 17 years. And in the kind of early 2000s, mid 2000s, people believe they could multitask very well. But that has shifted as of late and less people believe they can. Um, what we do know about multitasking is the brain is not built for it. So we are not efficient multitaskers, which means if we're doing more than one task that requires our mental energy, we are not doing any of those tasks very well. We're doing them, but we're not doing very well. That's why we're not supposed to text and drive, right? Slows the response rate down. Same thing with learning in class. Um, we also know that multitasking contributes to the release of cortisol, which is a stress hormone, which has a direct negative impact on short-term memory encoding in your brain. So if you're multitasking, you're artificially stressing yourself out, releasing that stress hormone, and you're not getting as much in your short term, which is where most learning occurs first, right? So all this to say, can we avoid multitasking? No. I currently have my phone out because my kid didn't get a ride home from school and my team's up because I'm out of the office and there's nobody in there and we have to juggle a lot of things these days. But if you're setting aside time to learn or study, the more you can do that at times where you can put other things away, it's going to be a lot more beneficial for your memory system and you're going to get a lot more out of that. So. 30 minutes of focused study time is much more fruitful than an hour of distracted time. So just think about that as you're setting up study, as you're finding places to study on campus. Think about what you need, what distracts you, and what works best. All right. What about this? Has anybody practiced this yet? I can explain or summarize my notes in my own words. Anybody do that on a regular basis? Okay. Why do you do that? How does that help you? Let's get a new voice. Do you mind talking? Huh? Solidifies your understanding for sure. Thank you. What else can this do for you? Yeah, it really does force you to focus on main ideas. Okay? As students, especially coming from K-12, unless you were homeschooled, but most likely even in a homeschool environment, details were drilled, right? Memorization was drilled. So we focused on the little bolded words and we memorized and we regurgitated, right? But here in this environment, that is most likely not the way you're going to be assessed. You're going to be assessed on connection and hierarchy. So knowing all the definitions isn't necessarily going to help you do well unless you know how they connect and relate to one another. Okay? Also, our brain stores information literally through connecting neurons, right? Neural networks. So if we can start to think about connections and activate them while we study, simply through summarizing our notes once a week, we're really working in the way that our brain naturally stores information. All right? Uh, and as you both said, right? Summarizing will for force active production. So where we have sometimes a tendency to go passive in our study, we look at the book, we look at the notes, we watch the videos, and we get a false sense of comfort, right? You're like, yeah, I know this, I know this, I know this. But if I took it away and asked you to tell me what it was about, could you do that, right? So writing out a summary or speaking out a summary forces that active participation. Now we have to actually pull that out of our brain and put it all together ourselves. We want you doing that before you get to the test. You're gonna have to do that on the test, but we don't want the test to be the first time you've tried doing this. We want it to be like the 26th time you've done this with this material, right? So we want to force that active production of material. We want to focus on main ideas and hierarchy, as you said. This is, again, where 
I feel table of contents for the unit you're covering can be really helpful in helping you talk through concepts and relationships. So going bare bones, one or two words, and just seeing if you can explain the connections there is a really good practice, all right? And then finally, if you're doing this on a weekly basis with your notes, you're creating like weekly cheat sheets that you can then go back to and use as a study tool. You don't have to wait for the study guide. I would do this a lot in grad school. And the density in grad school is pretty high, right? We have a lot that we're covering. Not a lot in terms of breadth, but a lot in terms of depth. Very focused topics we need to know everything about, right? And so one thing I learned very quickly with my lectures was summarize and then at the top just put the key words. That way when I'm flipping through and I need to write a paper or I need to study, I can easily find, it's like a glossary for your notes, right? You can find material very quickly and review at that point. Whew, getting tired. All right, what about this one? I reread my notes within 24 hours of leaving lecture. How many people in this room have done that? A few of you. I know some of us intend to do this and maybe don't get to it, right? Thursday comes and you just close it and you don't want to look at it. Why would we want to do this? Why would we want to look at notes so soon after taking them? Yeah, retaining information. We talked about memory. In short term, memory will hold information for about 24 to 48 hours. If we don't do something with what we've learned, our brain is concerned with efficiency, it's going to move on to something else. So if we're in lecture, if we're taking notes, we've got to continue to do stuff with that material to show our brain this is still important. We need to retain, right? So that helps with memory, moving it in the long term. Why else would this be useful? Any other ideas? Um, sometimes when you're in class it doesn't make sense, but then when you go over the again, it starts making sense. Yeah, so you can start to work on those connections. Right? Sometimes we need to see it two or three times, maybe even in different ways or from different angles, and we're like, oh, I get it now. Any other reasons? Has anybody had the experience of taking notes and like two weeks later they look at them to study for a test and they're like, what? This doesn't make any sense. I can't read my writing. Or I type too fast and it's a bunch of jumbo, like auto-corrected stuff, right? Even today when I typed an email, it auto-corrected and I sent it and didn't proofread and it made no sense, right? I had to apologize and rewrite. So it's important from a, like, organizational standpoint to make sure you're looking at those notes and you're thinking of your future self. In two weeks, in 12 weeks, if I have a cumulative final, I'm gonna still need these notes, right? In 12 weeks, will future me understand this? If you think no, then you add context, summary, page numbers, something in the notes so that it makes sense to your future self. Okay, so just from an organizational standpoint, you want to do this. Maybe not so important with some of your GEs unless you have a cumulative final, but definitely important for your major coursework because you will want to look back at those notes next semester because everything builds, right? It's all cumulative. Oh, also, as I mentioned before, we learn through forming neural connections. So these are neurons. Learn at different stages of the process, right? What stage is this? What do you think? Huh? <laughs> or let me ask this question. If you were a learner, where would you want to be on this map? Over here or over here? Are you? Yeah, all right. Yes, you'd want to be over here, right? This is 
somebody who knows the content very well might be able to teach it or tutor it, right? And so what happens when we learn is we have neurons, these little guys, and we learn something new and they grow dendrites, which are these tree-like branches, and they connect. The more we think about material, talk about it, see it or work with it in some way, the thicker those dendrites become, the stronger that neural network is, which means we can recall and we know this stuff like the back of our hand. What happens if we don't practice our knowledge? What do you think the brain does? Does it stay here? No. Your brain is concerned with efficiency. It's doing everything in the world for you, right? Everything. So if it doesn't see a purpose, it will start to dissipate the connection. And it might not go all the way back here, but it will probably be here. And that's when we have those moments of like, I've seen this before, I just can't think of what it is. Or how many times have you said like, I know their name, I knew I knew, I thought I knew their name, I can't think of it right now. And then a week later it comes to you just randomly. That's because your brain subconsciously is still working through these connections. Well, these old connections aren't there, but it'll work, work until it finally finds that little connection, okay? So what we want to do as learners is understand this and work with it as much as possible. Lots of repeated review. We're not talking hours, we're talking minutes. Just quick check-ins with material. Randomly pick a concept. Can you still work that problem? Can you still explain it? Right? And keep doing it throughout the semester. And that's going to get you to kind of maintain these connections. Okay? What about this question? I include examples of concepts in my notes and study guides. Who does this and why do you do this? Um, I usually do it when I have trouble understanding a concept. Um, just because if I have an example, then it'll definitely make things a lot easier. Yeah, so the example kind of will illuminate it in ways you didn't think about it before, right? And sometimes examples that we come up with are simple, and simple is usually best, right? It's the most memorable, it's the most understandable. I think a lot of students, especially first time freshmen, or we see this with our transfers too, is they feel like, okay, I'm here, I need to speak and think at this level, right? I need the fancy words, I need the, top level vocabulary and explanations. And that usually indicates to us that you've memorized, but it doesn't show understanding. Most of the time, if you truly understand something, you know what to leave out, how to simplify it to make it clear and concise. So simple is the way you wanna go. Also, I'm willing to bet your career path will take you to a place where you need to know the complex explanations, but you will also need to interface with the public who cannot understand this complexity, right? We're talking pharmacy, doctor, even a researcher. People spit out research and the public's like, I don't know what that means. Like, I'm not gonna take the time to figure that out, right? So if you can develop these two voices, through your study, you're kind of doing some professional development too. All right? Why else might this be useful? Any ideas? and learning, right? You have to engage with it. So it's going to stick with you better. Also, you're going to find out really quickly if you understand it or not and where the breakdown is. I tell students all the time, when you go to tutoring, please do not ask the tutor to show you how smart they are. Please don't say, I don't know how to do this problem. I don't understand this. Why is that a problem? What's the tutor gonna do? 
They're going to do it for you, or they're going to explain it to you. Right? And then if they're not well trained to follow up with extra questions, they're going to move on and you're, do you understand? Yeah. And you really don't. Right? And then you're stuck. What I'd like you to do, and what I'd like you to do in the practice of learning by yourself, is to practice your knowledge. Solve the problem. Solve the problem for the tutor and show them, look, I can do this part and then I break down right here. Then the tutor or faculty member will say, oh, I know exactly what's going on. Let me help you. Instead of just saying, I don't know this problem, they say, oh, here's the solution. And you're like, I still don't quite know. Like, there's a gap in my knowledge, right? So this will help illustrate the gaps in your knowledge and will help everybody help you a lot more efficiently. Also, I went off on a tangent, but also, most of the time, your test questions, especially if they're application, are going to look like examples. So the more you can integrate those examples into your study practice, you're preparing for the test cycle, or test style. Uh, this is called application style questioning or learning, right? You're not going to ask definition. They're going to give you something and ask you to sort it out or figure it out. This is an example from a Psych 100 exam. Did you? Burnout. Oh, I was going to ask that. So this is lifted off of a Psych 100 exam. And Psych 100 and Calm 130, 110, those classes are notorious for freshmen failing the first exam. Because freshmen study on the knowledge end of the taxonomy. They Memorize and define, or define and memorize, but the questions are application. So if you don't anticipate that and think about that as you study, it's going to kind of blow you out of the water the first time. This happens a lot too when you transition from lower to upper division coursework. But yeah, if we were given this question on an exam, the answer is burnout, right? So rather than defining and memorizing burnout, we could have just probably picked up a few key words from the definition and learned those. Remember, less is more when it comes to memory. So if we're talking four or five key words and we're remembering those, we're also going to probably be matching to the application because those keywords are still going to show up for us. What are a few key words associated with burnout or probably are in the definition of burnout? you see any? I see worn down. Worn down? I was going to say that. Okay. Overload. Overload. What else? Any others? Disillusioned. Disillusioned. Yeah, maybe helpless, right? So if we had picked these up in the definition of burnout, and just study the key words and then really force ourselves when studying to think through it and maybe create an example, and that was our method of studying, then we're really well prepared for any type of question we get. We can handle a basic definition question, but we can also handle the application style of question. So as you get your first exams back, hopefully you get them back. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you have to go to office hours to get them. But this is what I want you to pay attention to. Are your instructors using application style questions or are they using more like knowledge process based questions? That should tell you what you need to do to study moving forward. Okay? Again, me or my colleague uh, Lori Joy can go with you to check this out. This is what we do when we look at tests in office hours. We're really trying to look at the strategy from the instructor's side. Okay? Oh. Another question. There, it's backwards. So, what about this? This is our last question. I right, end each study session with a mini test. Who does this? Why do you do that? As you prepare for like the actual test. Yeah. So regular testing. The research shows regular testing, just the practice of it, makes you a better test taker. Not from the content knowledge side, but from the process procedural side. It makes you a faster reader. It helps you narrow uh, question or responses down if it's multiple choice. So if we want to get better at testing, we have to do more tests. 
right? And unfortunately, we have to get better. Material, you should go over again what you are. Yes, so this, if you do this regularly, it will help you organize your learning material for future study sessions. You should not be studying all the material the same amount of time. You know certain things better than others. So you've got to trust your knowledge, and you've got to work accordingly. Spend most of your time or start your sessions with the more difficult content and with the easy stuff. We don't want to forget about the easy stuff because it could slip back into short-term memory like we showed, right? But we want to always end. Do that when you're most tired. You don't need as much mental energy, okay? And so as I said, regular testing is a great way to um, reinforce those neural networks that I just talked about. It exercises the expressive pathway of the brain. A lot of times when we're talking about study, we're talking about putting it in, but we don't practice pulling it out, right? We've got to take the information out of our head and practice that process before we get to the test. Okay, and then as you said, that will help us figure out where we need to focus our energy as we study right before the exam. Okay? All right, one more thing I want to cover as we we're talking about kind of the taxonomy of learning, going from knowledge to application. This is a practice. We have this on, we have a worksheet on this on our webpage. But being able to move through these questions with a concept can really help activate all the different angles that you need to exercise in order to prepare for an exam. So writing about the term in book terms, right? Then putting it into your own words. If you can write an example, now we're at application, right? Can we create a diagram? That's diagrams or charts are a great way to also think about connection. Usually we don't make a diagram or chart about one thing, right? It's about multiple things and how they interact in their relationships. Um, and then finally, demonstrating the connection this has to something you've learned previously. This will start get you thinking about how this stuff's gonna come at you on an assessment. Your professors don't have enough time to ask you everything, right? An exam is gonna be the same with the exception of the final, it's gonna be about an hour, hour and a half, one day, one kind of sheet, right? So they have to maximize their questions to reach as much as they want you to know, or they want to evaluate as much as possible with the fewest questions possible. So when things can combine, they will combine. This goes for problem solving, this goes for conceptual courses. So anticipate that and start to look at these connections as you're studying. And then finally, if you're able to predict exam questions, it's a great metacognitive strategy to get you thinking about and putting yourself in the shoes of the professor. But also you can get really good at this. And then it's exciting if you are accurately predicting and you get to the test and you're like, I nailed it, right? I predicted this question. And that's where we can become better at strategy, the strategy of learning. Okay, so as I said, I work in the Learning Center, which is the building, I think over here. Uh, we are in Student Success Center, room 160. I am an academic coach, and there's about six of us in there. You can schedule appointments with us for free if you want to dig in deeper or talk about other learning topics, time management, exam prep, reading strategies, note taking, goal setting. We're here to support you in doing well as a student in things that aren't directly related to course content, but it's your approach to the content. So, as I said, we're nearing the first, the end of the first quarter. Think about how well you're doing to educate yourself, and if you feel like you could use some supports and some direction, come see us. To make an appointment, you go to Beach Connect, you hit Get Assistance, and then you're gonna select Academic Coaching as the option. This is the same way you make appointments for advisors, too. You just choose advisors, right? And then you go through and make that schedule. There's a picture of the building. And on our webpage, we have a lot of resources and worksheets related to what I talked about today, so feel free to check those out. We have some videos, too, that are short and sweet about learning topics. So 
That's about it, unless you have questions. No? Thank you all for coming and for participating. We made it Before you much go. easier. We'll let Sonia. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay, everyone. I know with NSCI 198, uh, there's been a lot of questions as far as if my class conflicts with a, a, a certain event, you know, will I get dot points or will, how can I make it up? So the way it works is you have an option to go to an event. If you can't go to that event, it's okay. You don't have to go to all of them. You can make up a module. And I know that at this point, uh, about four or five modules have been released. So you all can start looking at those modules. You don't have to do every module either. There's going to be a lot more that are going to be released. Okay. So the purpose of NSEI is actually it, it's to be a resource for you. Okay. You'll be able to see in the modules things that you know what I need a little bit more review on this. I came to this, you know, uh, workshop because I want to learn more about my academic habits, etc. Right? So don't worry if you're not able to go to the event. That I guess that's what I'm trying to get to. Um, it, it's okay. Make it up with the module. Now, as you can see, I'm recording the session. So uh, let your friends know that if they miss the session uh, in about two, three weeks, I will be posting the video in the Thrive website and then give an opportunity for either for you guys to go back and check it out or, you know, for them to make of that point, okay? On your way out, I'm requesting for you to scan this QR code. This is how we are able to improve these, uh, these types of workshops and events. It's an, it's an evaluation. It's like two, three minutes to take, so uh, with that, have a great evening, you guys.